Hello everyone. The topic of teaching translation technologies is becoming more and more um, interesting and in demand at various conferences. And Aline and I presented at the latest Aptis uh, conference at the University of Aston uh, last year, uh, late last year. Um, and we got pretty good feedback, uh, we would say. Um, and it seemed that there was a demand for uh, the information that we shared to be shared more more widely. Um, so here we are recording our presentation um, in a bit more detail and sharing it with the community and hoping that what um, what we have on these slides and the experience we're going to talk about is uh, relevant to all of you. So let's introduce ourselves. Um, so my name is Alina Sekara. I've been teaching um, subtitling, audiovisual translation and translation technologies for the last um, 10 years um, here at the University of Leeds where I'm also in charge of the MA in audiovisual translation studies. Um, I'm also a freelance theatre captioner um, and I used to be an in-house um, technical writer and translator so I bring all of this experience that I have in the professional sector into the classroom um, as as you will see later on um, both of us find it quite useful to link the academic world with the commercial um, and and also the uh, the nonprofit sectors to apply the information that we we have at the university into uh, real world practices okay and my name is Dragos Chobanu. Uh, my background is also in languages and uh, translation studies. Um, I used to be a technical writer and in-house translator at the same company that Alina used to work uh, at. And then I came to Leeds uh, in 2003 and did my PhD in computer assisted language learning. And ever since I've been playing with uh, and learning about and working with translation technologies and project management technologies as well as e-learning um, technology because I spent some time in the e-learning field uh, as well. So um, Alina has been running the MA in audiovisual translation studies for a lot longer than I have been running the MA in applied translation studies at the University of Leeds. But between the two of us, we've managed to see a lot of technology changes and also different industry trends depending on the year and even decade. I know, it sounds like we're ancient now, very old. Um, but there we are. Um, so we blend a uh, strong interest in what the industry is doing, so pragmatic view of um, training technologies with our own backgrounds in, uh, in translation and also with an interest in what's happening with the software providers uh, and what the developments in research um, are. And we were invited to a couple of conferences to talk about uh, this topic of uh, teaching translation technologies because um, one of our modules, in fact the biggest module that we run at the University of Leeds, uh, which we will talk about um, in a little bit, um, is currently, and we're very grateful for it, and we working very hard to keep it that way, is currently seen in a very positive light by our industry partners. Um, I've had a read through your module outline, uh, because also we tend, as an aside, sorry, uh, we tend to share uh, what we teach with the companies that we work with so that they can give us feedback on our modules and so we can improve and make them more relevant. So this person has been helping us with, uh, with our teaching for, for very many years. Um, and now she said, uh, I've had a read through your module outline and I have nothing but praise for it. It's the best MA module content I've seen and it covers everything and more that we could ask uh, for when hiring graduates, whether they'd be hired as uh, project managers, PMs, translators, or in some uh, sort of junior tech role. The students taking this module will have a massive advantage in the amount of practical industry information they are familiar with when they come out of uni. So. In a way, apologies for being slightly immodest, um, but we just thought we would um, give you a bit of information about the credentials so that you know you're not totally wasting your time watching this video, I guess. Yeah, mm -hmm. does that make sense? Okay. 
So one of the um, motivations or something that's uh, really sometimes even keeping us up at night um, is the fact that there is the language services industry. Our students, um, the ones we train every year, join this industry, but it seems that there are some serious problems um, in, in this industry. And Slater had a, an article um, in the middle of last year, 2018, about reasons, and there were quite a few, uh, for professionals leaving the industry. And we keep an eye on such industry trends because we don't want first of all, to misinform our students about what to expect, but also it's very important to notice how we could help, how our modules could could change you know, to, in order to address uh, such issues. So in the case of the uh, article we just mentioned on Slater, and by all means, please go and read it because it's a, it's a very interesting, much longer article than you see on the screen. Um, there are a few very interesting things um, because what the respondents to this um, survey were saying to Slater was that there is, um, first of all, in the industry, um, there is a bit of a trend not to, um, especially for the project managers, not to feel valued. And therefore, as you can see in this second bullet point, project managers join the industry and in some companies they just have to do absolutely everything and they don't really feel that there is recognition for their work. Uh, the third bullet point is especially about that, um, about making uh, people aware of how much work is behind uh, the translation um, jobs. And this is something that we try and you'll see how uh, the University of Leeds to give our students the complete picture. Um, and also, it was in, the last point is very interesting um, about the honesty around quality assurance um, in the translation industry and the localization industry. And again, we will talk about a need for ethics and um, applying the right tools in the right context, not just applying something because it uh, is there. So it's clear that the industry does have a few problems and some of them could be um, solved perhaps with more information but others will need a bit more work uh, on the part of everyone to actually do what they're supposed to be doing and do it well. Another thing that we keep an eye on are surveys which are generated by um, the um, uh, EU Tech, so the European Association of Translation Companies, um, with Elia and with Gala. So you probably know that every year they um, they do the survey. So this is the latest one in 2018, um, and they it's very helpful because they ask pretty much the same questions every year. Uh, so that now they can already make some quite useful and meaningful comparisons um, coming from 2013 up to 2018. As you see on this slide. Um, so this slide is particularly about um, you know, what are companies, what are the challenges that the companies face or they consider they face in the in the near future. And one of them is the skills gap between the industry uh, and university. And this is, you know, this is already famous because every time we, we hear about this, uh, this gap, um, and it's in a way, if you want, it's slightly depressing that it if we look at uh, here at the figures, um, you know, it doesn't seem to to go away. It seems to be pretty constant uh, throughout these years. Um, so of course the challenges um, are you know are still there, and you, you may probably say that the challenges that the universities are fa facing, but also that the industry um, are facing, um, are more and more. Uh, you know, important uh, every year. Um, but for us, what is relevant is, at this point is to uh, to see that, unfortunately, this skills gap is, is still existing and trying to understand it and also to see how we can address it um, and try to understand both sides, so the industry, but also the, uh, the challenges that universities and training institutes have. Yeah. And I think it's also, if, if we look at the same graph, it's uh, almost quite scary that it seems that the challenge of not finding uh, qualified enough graduates mm -hmm. is even bigger than the challenge of governments introducing new regulations or companies considering to introduce a new language. 
in their service. So it's a it's a big problem that doesn't seem to go away. Okay, so um, so coming back to the, the to the topic of our uh, of our presentation, you know, what can we do ab about this, and how can we shape the training that we provide in such a way that we we are uh, we are training uh, students which can who can respond uh, suitably to uh, to the needs of the market, but also who can who are rounded individuals who can think for themselves, um, who can see the larger picture, who are able of critical analysis, uh, who are able to question uh, the you know the technology, but also the, the the problems and the questions that they are faced with in in a workplace, irrespective of that workplace being a company, an NGO, uh, an academic institution. Um, I think. It, it you know it's our responsibility to train these rounded individuals mm. uh, so first of all I think in order to do that it's important to answer a few questions relevant questions and probably all of you ask uh, yourselves these questions before you deliver a course or when you you're designing it um, so first of all whom are we teaching you know who are the students why are we teaching this why are we still here um, what is stable in an evolving industry? In other words, are you know are there any baseline assumptions that we can make about uh, what we can teach? Um, who is teaching? This is fairly relevant. Uh, what should we be teaching? Should we just have all the cat tools in the world? Should we offer many many language combinations? Um, how should we be teaching and this is linked to who is teaching and their ability to maybe be flexible sometimes um, and how are we assessing because we are working in academic institutions and we know that everything needs to be assessed um, the resources that we have um, and should we actually do it you know is this a field that is promising enough uh, to to actually continue delivering training and doing research in, um, so we we will see. Um, okay, um, so let's start. It's as you can see, it's a quite an ambitious uh, plan to cover, but we will do our best. So first of all, um, when we ask ourselves in Leeds the question, whom are we teaching? We also use a little bit of technology available and some uh, surveys that our university very helpfully has in place uh, for, for all academics to use. So normally um, admission to a translation studies course is based on performance in a translation test. Uh, we have that but we also we don't know a lot from the application. Of course you know you find out a little bit about the motivation of the candidates as well as uh, their previous grades, but you don't know exactly what kind of persons they are and what kind of aspirations they have and anything more meaningful that helps you design the course and personalize it a bit. So we are very aware that there are no such things as learning styles, so some of the terminology on this slide um, is perhaps a bit ambitious or outdated, but the idea is that Sometimes when we talk to colleagues uh, who are also teaching at MA level, um, we see that there is a strong assumption that MA level students are all super inquisitive and they are there with lots of questions and a lot of independence. Uh, they're already independent learners, excellent researchers, they know how to find information and filter it out. and They just need challenges and then they'll go away and they will solve them. But when we run these, and we run these tests, uh, or surveys rather, uh, at the beginning of each year, we find out that actually the percentage of those kind of students, the innovators, the ones who just need the teachers to, or the tutors to give them an assignment and they're happy to go away and dig into it, is not as high as most MA level tutors think it is. So what we discover is that we have a lot more um, activators in the terminology of this particular survey. So students who actually need a lot of very solid information, clear information about what they're doing, why they're doing it, in order to then go and do it. So they need 
the background information, the context information, the information itself, and then they need a challenging scenario then to put the information to test and actually do some active learning um, in order to acquire it. So this is something that um, was a little bit surprising uh, in the beginning, but it's helping us a lot with the design and the redesign of our learning materials uh, in order to make sure that our students are achieving as much as they can uh, when we are with us. And I think it will be helpful if programs everywhere were to supplement their entrance um, information with such quite easy to do psychometric testing. And this is also in a way again trying to match what the industry is doing but because probably you know those of you who have applied to you know various even you know institutions um, would have done such a test in in the past and you would have been put in a category and then you you have some sort of report telling you you know you're quite good at this but probably you need to work a little bit more on this um, so you know for example a student uh, getting um, this type of result saying that they're more of an ins inspector rather than a supporter probably they would be told that you know your your teamwork um, is probably you know not not that well developed mm -hmm. maybe you need to to improve that element uh, so of course always these kind of results need to be taken with a uh, with a pinch of salt um, but overall it adds an extra layer of information about uh, where the strength and the weaknesses of a current cohort lie um, and then allows you at least the opportunity to design or to introduce support or further resources to to enhance the learning experience of that particular cohort. Yeah. And I think on this point, I don't know about you, but I find it quite useful and interesting and fun even um, for me to take these tests as well because it's it's something that well let's bring it back to the students um, perhaps some of you watching have had the same experience uh, we get cohorts every year through the nature of the program in in the UK so it's a one-year program um, but we get cohorts of very enthusiastic uh, students who want to um, to learn at MA level and, and develop their their skills but they're not really sure what they want to do after the MA or what kind of jobs are available to them. And then through doing such a psychometric te uh, test, which Alina was saying that it's very widely used in the industry, you would have heard of Myers-Briggs. This is something very, very similar. Um, then if they see that it looks like from the psychometric test done in even before the course begins, that they are they have some coordination skills maybe this or not maybe surely uh, this already sets them up thinking perhaps i could work in the industry as a project manager um, or depending on the other result they decide maybe i thought i could be a project manager but maybe this is not for me so it just gives them a different perspective it doesn't of course it doesn't shut down options but it just gives them a different perspective and makes them see the activity and the course in a more professional manner. It's not just a university course, it's actually a stepping stone into the industry. So I think everyone will benefit if we implement this more, uh, more regularly. Okay, um, the second question we were thinking uh, is very relevant to, to everyone watching this is why are we teaching? So we're talking about MA level translation courses um, with a lot of technology but are we teaching out of nostalgia because we there was, we remember a time when things were done in a particular way and we just want to prolong that and to show um, our own tools of the trade to new generations um, or are we teaching to serve the needs of a particular current niche so perhaps we have a wonderful relationship with one language service provider who tells us they need X amount of terminologists and therefore we'll just start churning out terminologists. Um, the question then becomes what happens when that relationship with the LSP ends? What happens when the industry doesn't need terminologists anymore? Are we ready to be that flexible? Or are we teaching, as Alina was saying, this, uh, she was, I think you were talking about rounded mm -hmm. individuals. 
So are we teaching rounded individuals with a variety of skills and also a lot of resilience uh, able to cope with an uncertain future? So why are we asking these questions? Simply because, for instance, if we are looking at the Taos report from September 2016, um, if we look at how Taos presents the uh, evolution of the industry and think about what we do in terms of technology in our own uh, courses, sometimes we will find programs who, I hope you'll forgive me for saying, but it's true, um, are sort of teaching the past. So in some programs, we're really stuck in the 90s. Um, we might have one CAT tool, we might have one piece of terminology software, and there might be some project TMs, uh, translation memories, but there is really nothing like the the amount. If we look at the rest of the of the um, this graph and the Tau's predictions, so there is nothing like the amount of collaboration, speed, um, complex technology, new technologies, mobile technologies, machine translation. There's none of that happening in some of the programs, and it's not out of the bad will of uh, the the, um, the programs themselves um, it's just that we need to acknowledge that we need more skills sometimes and we also need a bit of effort to bring these uh, programs into the 21st century really um, so this is a really good um, report i'm sure you'll uh, you'll get a lot out of it um, and when, again, to, to take that idea a bit further, um, when we think about what does the industry regularly ask from uh, translation programs, um, it's interesting to acknowledge that uh, first and foremost, usually the languages. So the language knowledge uh, comes uh, in the, at the top of the request list. Uh, first of all, mother tongue, very important, and then the foreign languages. Um, the technical skills are there as well, but more and more over the last three, four years, we've seen that the industry is starting to ask for a lot more. So adaptability, problem solving, professionalism, a lot of what is called soft skill, um, because they actually need productive uh, graduates to join uh, their teams. Um, and even uh, as a further development recently, we are seeing that companies are looking for attitude in the recruits and they're, they're sometimes ready just to train the skills themselves. So this thing about being proactive and resilient, um, we need to really make sure our programs address uh, this, this need. And if we look again at the the survey which we uh, we mentioned a, f a few minutes ago, so again uh, coming from your tech and, and Gala and, and Elia, um, and with looking at what uh, what the language industry is saying that they would like new recruits to have, mm -hmm. um, in the middle there we we still see that the that translation technology skills. Um, are still, you know, partially developed in mm. in these new recruits, and to be again to be fair to the to the trainers and to the to the training courses, technology changes very very fast. So what used to be, you know, a, a good and robust uh, technological skill only last year, you know, it's it's developed this year to be something else. Uh, so we need to be very agile in in what we are teaching and. The, and what we are exposing our students to, in order to um, to allow them to um, to enhance this technological knowledge that they would have. So this will mean, like we will say in the uh, in the next few slides, um, you know that uh, knowing how one cat tool works is no longer sufficient. Yeah, it's it's not the knowledge of one particular tool um, that we should be very interested in, but it's is the whole principle of how is that technology working how is that technology integrating with with other technologies um, yeah so it's high level knowledge but also practical experience of several tools because we can have a very theoretical course about how various tools should slot in together 
but it's not going to be of great use uh, if the students actually don't touch a wide range of tools to come up against the problems and solve those problems. Sure. And also sometimes, um, maybe in some courses, we, we believe that, okay, if we have an internship uh, as part of the, of the degree, all of these problems, maybe the more commercial ones, are going to be addressed while a student is doing an internship. Well, that's not necessarily the case because, as we know, internships are, you know, they vary widely. In some programs, for example, in the UK, we just run one year MA programs. Our students generally don't have time to do an internship. Um, but in, in those countries where internships do exist, um, this is another, uh, these are the results of another survey uh, ran by, by Elia, um, which shows that what an intern does, again, very much differs from one company to the other. And we may think that something very relevant like desktop publishing skills is addressed throughout uh, internships. Actually, if we look at this picture, is is not. Um, so again, a bit of awareness of what a what an internship does is is always good. And it's also difficult to control uh, because each company receiving interns will have their own setup and their own needs. So they can't just take on a lot. Ev well, the whole of the responsibility from us about teaching our students the practical needs. So we need to actually own up to that responsibility and implement and make sure and control uh, the technical skills that we want our students to have. We need to train them at least to start training them in our courses. Mm. Okay. Um, I think this is one of perhaps the last point on internships. Um, again, the latest um, the latest survey that Alina mentioned, the uh, EU ATC and Elia and Gala um, and FIT, I think also um, with the European Masters in Translation uh, inputting too, they were um, asking companies how they feel the role of the intern was uh, for them and unsurprisingly you would see here that the vast majority of companies would expect the interns uh, to be an added value to the business so don't expect that you are going or any trainer is going to send students to companies and shouldn't worry about how much uh, knowledge those students practical knowledge actually have uh, in order to help those companies because probably you'll find out the second time the company will not be as willing to receive your students um, if they're not very good. So first of all, in terms of internship, one issue is the length. Um, from what we were talking to, um, from the companies we were talking to, it seems that six months would be a preferred length of time for companies. That's not always possible in the, in the academic setting. Um, and also, so we need to, to work on that. And also less than, well, almost half of the respondents were saying that the students didn't actually have all the skills that they needed them to have. So there's a lot of work to be done in the academic uh, setting in order to uh, train our students. So hopefully we'll have some ideas uh, very soon. Um, talking about the future, um, just a very quick note to say that um, some of the industry members are already talking about new concepts and new technologies such as blockchain. So Taos had a, a webinar in September last year um, with three representatives uh, from companies who are looking at implementing uh, blockchain. Um, and they were talking, it was interesting to, to hear, um, they were talking about new roles. Um, so we might be used to the translation, translator, reviser, terminologist role, um, but actually they're talking about slightly different things. They're talking about miners um, who are uh, just providing information. They're talking about polishers who are checking the maybe translation memories uh, or the validity of glossaries um, and they're validating these assets and enhancers. Um, and all of these roles bring different uh, constraints, uh, training needs with them, 
Um, and who knows, maybe this is actually, there might be a bit of hype now uh, because the technology is new, but who knows, it might be part of the industry. So we can't just ignore um, the, the early adopters um, in this case. Uh, we need to keep, um, keep in touch with what's happening and train our students to be resilient and ask them, you know, what would you do if you were in this scenario? How, would, how do you think you would act best or would you, what role would you prefer and what would that uh, involve? So this would involve that we, we need to, to train linguists in the, in the IE era and to train them how to compete against this faster, cheaper models of business. Uh, you know, this model exists. Um, so one way of doing this is to, to tell the students, you know, or to look closer of how can we specialize? Um, how can you find creative fields where maybe the, the current machine translation engines are, you know, are not as competitive if you want? Um, how do you look at working with clients, but also what does that mean? Because it's very easy to say, oh, you know, you go and work with direct clients and you will make more money. Yeah, but there are a lot of challenges and a lot of extra skills that you need as a, uh, as a linguist to be able to put yourself comfortably and efficiently in, in that position. Um, then we need to show them how to actually create workflows, how to integrate uh, resources into into a workflow, how to automate repetitive tasks, um, how to make all this technology uh, work and work efficiently uh, together. Um, so it's it's no longer a case that you are. A, um, a linguist and you get something to translate and you translate it and you send it back uh, because I think we all agree that that's quite an outdated uh, model of, of training linguists. It's beautiful and romantic mm -hmm. but unfortunately the industry is looking for something else. So, yeah, so we're trying, I think this you'll see this a few times, so our motto is that we want, we'll do our very best not to train hamsters. So linguists that do the same repetitive task, simply because if you've been uh, watching the industry lately, um, the biggest drive nowadays is on automated, uh, automating repetitive tasks. So if we just teach our students to do the same thing over and over again, they will find themselves out of a job very soon. So is there any help or any const, you know, are there any constants, uh, are there, is there any, you know, baseline of quality that we should uh, look to and try to implement when we are designing a course mm -hmm. where there are quite a few and we were going to start with the competence framework which was developed as part of the EMT network in, in 2017. This is an update of the of the previous one and a lot of work uh, has gone into, into this. Um, and as probably all, a lot of you know, all of you will know, this, these are based on skills that we assume uh, that an MA level in, in translation um, will will support students to achieve uh, during their their training um, and you will uh, you will find this uh, if you don't if you don't have it already it's uh, it's available online and we put a, a link there and I think we should also mention that these skills just in case someone is worried that this is just a list of skills produced by some lecturers in some random offices um, actually the European Masters in Translation works very closely with um, all the professional organizations through uh, Lindweb. So we work with Gala, ELIA, UATC and so on. Um, so the industry actually had a lot of input. Um, and even more interestingly, what we're finding nowadays is that some company adverts for jobs in the um, language services industry pick up and list some of these skills, quite a lot of them, as requirements for their um, new recruits. So definitely it's a list of skills that is worth paying attention to. Also, um, other support that's available out there and references which we in Leeds find very, very useful 
um, and this is a, a screenshot from um, from one of our core module, our technology module uh, reading list, um, mm -hmm. are standards, so ISO standards, uh, which were developed in, in the industry. Mm -hmm. And these introduce students not only to very relevant information about, uh, you know, the, the content and the uh, regulations that exist uh, regarding um, a particular field. So, for example, there's a standard on post-editing of machine translation. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a standard on terminology, there's one for quality assurance, um, uh, probably the um, the one that uh, most of you would have heard of is the ISO 17100 uh, of translation services um, and it's it's quite a useful read and in addition to uh, to the content that maybe you you might expect to have you'll also have really great resources or annexes um, where so in ESO 17100 you also have an example of a translation workflow so if you want to demonstrate to your students at the beginning of the course that when you're working as a translator you're not working in a vacuum but actually you are a, um, a small wheel in this uh, in this big process uh, then a very visual and clear representation of a you know fairly easy project um, can be brought from from this uh, from this standard mm -hmm. okay um, so another question that's usually asked um, is who is teaching these courses and in case we haven't mentioned this already enough um, we really don't claim to have all the answers and actually some of these ideas come from researchers and scholars who've been talking about this for a, a lot longer um, than we have. Um, and there are already very good programs out there. Uh, we're just summarizing some of these points for the benefit of uh, the community. So one um, school of thought would be that um, just having language and culture um, experts and scholars uh, is enough. Um, other schools of thoughts insist on having actual translators. Uh, some are looking for both uh, combinations and some just say that industry experts on their own will be doing a wonderful job. Um, but then we have the issue of experts teaching novices. So sometimes um, you will have guests from the industry who have been doing their work for such a long time and they've been using the software for such a long time that they don't really know how to explain all the steps in the process. So they just assume a lot, a lot of knowledge. So there is a bit of an issue with just relying solely on industry experts. So watch out about that. Um, there's a bit of discussion on the amount of professional experience that the trainers should have. And ideally, you will have in your programs uh, technology teachers who also worked at some stage in the past or still do as uh, freelance translators or in-house translators and they keep their skills up to date uh, with the technology. And then there's also the very important uh, question of continuous development. How do these trainers maintain their skills and also what is their career path? And just as a tip or I'm, I'm guessing some of you are also um, using this. Um, in Leeds, we've been very grateful um, to, to the Erasmus Plus uh, program, which a few years ago allowed, started allowing academics to visit companies as well. So not just academics visiting academics, but also academics going into companies and seeing what a real life scenario looks like and what the challenges are. So we've been taking a lot of advantage. Um, well, sorry, that sounds evil um, or naughty, at least. Uh, we haven't been taking advantage. We've been benefiting as much as everyone else uh, from this program and gaining very valuable information that we then could pass on to our students. And it seems to have helped them uh, quite a lot. And then, so moving on to another relevant point is what should we teach? So now that we know who should be teaching or, and 
uh, you know, who are we teaching? So what should we integrate in these courses when you have a translation technology course? Um, so it goes without saying, probably after half an hour of uh, into our presentation already, you see that we care quite a lot of what is happening in the in the marketplace. Mm. Um, and again, when designing the courses, there are a lot of resources out there to help you take the appropriate decisions. So for example, if you are at the stage where um, you are designing a specialized translation course and you don't know what kind of text to incorporate or what kind of maybe specialization to uh, to allow your students to take, maybe looking at, uh, again, some of the surveys, this is the 2017 language industry survey, um, having a look at what companies say and mm. also independent professionals say that they have you know what has represented the bulk of their work mm. over the last year or years would give you an indication as to the interest and the appetite for a particular field um, mm. out there so you know as, as much as uh, we may like to our students to be able to do literature translation we know that there unfortunately there isn't a lot of demand out there or for certain languages there certainly isn't a lot of demand out there so you know you then you can look at, at information like this and see, ah, you know, legal, financial, medical, uh, automotive for some languages automotive is huge um, you know, these provide exciting opportunities for the students, but also for for researchers and for um, for, for teachers as well. Um, and of course, within each and every one of these fields, there are subfields. Um, you know, the medical uh, field is huge, and it can contain quite a lot of different text types. Uh, so you you can explore and unpack this information in a very meaningful way um, as part of your course design. Yeah. And if you've got uh, relationships or if you, we, we found that generally language service providers, companies are very open to give advice or share what kind of texts they are working on um, or, or they have uh, to, to work on. Um, so just ask and you will get suggestions. You, so you're not alone, basically. Um, that's, uh, that's, I guess, the big takeaway. Um, but also, at the same time, we are looking at the, at the marketplace, we're looking at the, uh, the commercial sector, but of course, this sector m itself, maybe it's not always up to date. Again, mm. that, you know, the pinch of salt that we should ourselves uh, apply as well. Um, so this is just uh, one uh, screenshot to illustrate this point. Um, in one of the, um, it was, I think, the 2016 um, UK, uh, language service providers survey uh, with 588 respondents, as you can see, um, we can see that not everyone is using even translation memory. So 35% of the respondents are claiming to be doing perfectly fine without using this very popular uh, technology. Um, and if we are to look further, even further than translation memory, Speech recognition, it seems that a very small minority is using it, so we might deduce that we shouldn't really bother with this. Machine translation, it's fashionable in some circles, but again, uh, not many people say they use it. And quality assurance, again, and that's very worrying, in fact, um, people are either unaware of what it means or they're simply ignoring it. But actually, all of these four technologies are extremely important in the big scheme of things and in the big process of translation. So just we also need to apply a bit of common sense and also um, look around a bit more in order to future proof our students. So don't just reflect on what's been happening so far and what the market thinks at this particular stage, but also try and think ahead um, what kind of technologies are useful for the future and also you know be aware that from one survey to another there might be significant changes so always try to you know, orient yourselves within the constraints of of those uh, those publications as well yeah, yeah that's a big important point because i think there were uh, quite a few more 
a lot more freelancers answering this survey than the previous one, mm -hmm. the earlier one. So you need to know who's behind uh, giving the answers. Um, so here from the same document, you can see that it seems that if you are earning less than 25,000 euros a year, then you will get away, well, in a way, get away um, with not using technology too much. But actually, if you're the, the bigger the turnover, the fewer opportunities um, you have to actually ignore this technology. So again, are we training our students to be freelancers on a small income, doing this maybe as a part-time job, or are we, do we want to enable them to work for large corporations and run a localization program maybe? So if it's the latter, we really can't ignore technology in that case. Okay, so in addition to the reality of the marketplace, it's always useful to teach the overall picture of the industry, which is always moving. So it's a challenge, but it's also quite exciting. Um, so the entire localization process is no longer, as everyone uh, watching this will agree, is no longer having some initial content and through some magic process having it translated and a wizard um, being in the middle with some super exciting skills um, because actually a lot more is happening in that middle so as you can see some of the um, technology providers uh, this is a screenshot from an SDL training manual so some of the technology providers are already uh, offering uh, resources which show our students what kind of processes they could expect in the in the marketplace. So this is very neat. It's lovely stages in a project moving seamlessly from box to box. Um, we can use it and it's already a step forward, but it's a little bit reactive um, because we need to be more realistic. So if you have any friends in a translation company, they will tell you that such a process is a wonderful ideal, but really the projects where the, the client gets the product or the project manager gets what they need to deliver to the project, um, to, the, to the client, is a lot more messy. And it involves false starts, it involves challenges, and you really need to experience it in order to become comfortable and know it. And in terms of what we are uh, training our students to be able to do, um, actually working on processes and workflows, um, so being able to design a whole process from the uh, client thinking even about producing a piece of content until the very end after localizing this content is a very useful skill and again uh, this um, slide and the following one um, have uh, screenshots from work done by Denis de Chandon uh, when he was working for the translation center for the bodies of the European Union and now he has a shiny very exciting new role or he's had it for a, for a while but it's just to give you uh, an idea and by all means, the, I mean, this is not, you're not meant to be able to be reading this, but this is just to show you how a process of handling content, how messy it is, and also how many decision factor are, fact, factors are there and who signs off what aspects in order for the process to, uh, to proceed and what happens if something goes wrong and so on. So students, sometimes we see the, they come with this romantic view that all they need to do is to do a wonderful translation, but they don't really understand what happens if they're late, uh, what happens if the translation actually isn't as good as they think it is, uh, what their place is, and they really need to understand all of this in order to become better professionals. And it's, it's not just a matter of showing them these graphs, but it's actually putting them in a position where they're actually designing them, mm -hmm. where they are the architects of a project and they are deciding and at the same time taking responsibility for one step going wrong mm -hmm. and the implications that that may have on the, on the rest of the project. Yeah. So depending on how much time you have in your own programs, 
of course, getting to this stage of this level of competence is going to take a long time and a lot of practice. Um, but even making important steps on this uh, road is extremely valuable for our students. So again, uh, this comes from Denis' work. Um, in terms of, to just take another um, example, machine translation is uh, another very popular topic at the, at the time, uh, right now. So some people are talking about machine translation just as in it's good enough, let's apply it to absolutely everything and everywhere. But if we are looking at a very interesting uh, report from the Common Sense Advisory, which is, again, a, a very useful resource we, we look at uh, regularly in Leeds, um, machine translation does add the work, um, does help the workflow, but it can be applied in various settings with professional linguists, without professional linguists, there are variations when sometimes you might not even need anyone, so everything is uh, um, is automatic. So we need to give our students all these perspectives and all these different scenarios so that they don't just come out of our courses thinking, now machine translation is A good, B bad, and nothing in between and it can be or cannot be applied to absolutely anything because there are so many variables and speaking of variables uh, just to give an example um, this is one of the later articles very interesting from uh, coming out of uh, ad the ADAPT Center in Dublin with an evaluation of machine translation and you'll see here uh, depending on the language pairs depending on the technology used the variations, the length of the source text, uh, you'll see the variations in, in results. So we need we need to move away from the right wrong answers to the it depends and then we need to learn all these um, variables. What does it depend on in order to have a functional uh, system? And then adding on to what we should be teaching, I think everybody now agrees that it's not a matter of having one CAD tool, um, the students sit down, click, 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 and they know that technology, mm -hmm. but we we need to add a variety of technologies uh, into into the mix, uh, not only CAD tools, but, uh, but different ones, and we will mention them um, later on um, and of course this is not new uh, this has been you know to said over and over by many many people mm -hmm. but again unfortunately due to various constraints um, not everybody can integrate uh, different tools and most importantly um, a lot of a lot of trainers find themselves in a situation where even if in a course you can cover various tools, these tools tend to be taught in separate modules. Yep. And therefore, the students don't have the ability to mix and match uh, to see, for example, how does a speech recognition tool integrate with a, within a CAT tool? Uh, how do you use it for, for a revision task? Or how do you do subtitling with machine translation within a CAT tool or things like this? is very difficult to, to implement, uh, but these are the kind of scenarios that would be very useful to, to have as part of a, of a training. Yeah. So for the next three slides, we're not going to read it out because you're watching this, so you can pause it if you, if you wish. Um, but we've got um, Lynn Bowker's words um, from uh, from a very useful, um, relevant both chapter and the whole book, in fact, from 2014, explaining uh, the, the need for integrating modules and also integrating tools within modules, um, as, as Alina mentioned. Um, so yeah, so it's a challenge if we, I mean, it, we do realize that it is easier to organize um, all this individual module teaching and one tool but we really need to make the effort as, as trainers to 
maybe combine assessments or to have projects that go across modules just to give our students the, these realistic challenges uh, so that they can combine the knowledge and put it to work in realistic settings. So again, if we if we going back to looking at examples, uh, you know, if you are in a course where you have a terminology module and then a translation module, um, and they are taught by completely different people, um, of course there are real difficulties that that have to be overcome to to put these together. But we believe the advantages of of doing that are are enormous. Yeah, and there's some really interesting work now being done in Zurich about having program level assessments instead of module specific assessments. Um, and I think we should all learn from that or strive uh, to, to this aim as well. And I'm sure there are, there are other research centers doing very relevant works as well. So yeah, we're coming back to the motto, let's not train hamsters doing repetitive things let's train students who know how to integrate and be creative as well uh, so that they have meaningful jobs and rewarding jobs so um, before we get on to the uh, technology as Zalina was saying uh, we aim to have a situation that is as far away from this as possible so we've been talking to project managers in various companies and we often hear um, this uh, a project manager saying that they couldn't actually use a particular linguist who had the right language skills and the, the domain uh, specialization because that linguist was using a different cat tool or some different technology or maybe not even any technology at all um, and they had to give the job to someone else who wasn't as suitable but they were using the technology so what we are saying is the technology now is flexible enough to allow all kinds of workflows and there is really very there are very few excuses uh, to not use the best people for the job um, anymore and this is just to show how big an influence the training of the next generation if you want has in the shaping of the requirements of the industry mm -hmm. um, so even more um, you know the our task is to is to create students who go onto these roles who are able to think creatively and who are able to implement solutions that are flexible enough for everybody to you know to to be able to work in. Yeah. And we're not talking about one student boldly going into a company and militating or lobbying for implementing all the tools they've been working with because we do realize that actually buying a tool and implementing it into a company's workflow is a huge task and it's not as easy uh, as that but a lot of companies out there actually have a lot more than just one tool um, and therefore not being able to see how all of those tools work together is not very productive so generally going back to our you know our problem of course design and, and program design we really need bigger modules mm. with more allocated time to be able to do this. And again, we we are fortunate in a way in, in Leeds to be able to have uh, a big module. We would like it to be even bigger. Mm. Um, but so, for example, here are our um, computer assisted translation um, module runs across both semesters and has uh, four hours per week. Every week is very intense. It all happens in in a lab. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of resources uh, there to support the students and also the trainers. So we've got demonstrators, uh, a lot of hands-on tasks, handouts, recordings, uh, virtual learning environment mm -hmm. where we can have discussions after the the class finishes. Um, of course, you know, you need IT clusters, um, you need licenses. So there's a lot of investment um, in, in such, a, such a training setup. Yeah, so when we start talking about licenses, we wanted to share with you over the next few slides and, uh, few slides and prepare because this is gonna be a little bit intense. Um, 
something uh, some information that we found out um, in the European Masters in Translation uh, network. The aim was to see across the network what kind of translation technologies the partners were teaching. So within the EMT, uh, we launched a survey expecting only to see how many licenses of which capital were in use. Actually, what we got was a lot more and together we put um, what it looks like maybe an ideal or at least a, certainly a very useful technology setup. Um, so a bit of a map on what kind of technologies you can have in order to train these uh, our students with all of these um, problem solving and um, creative combination of technology skills. So we grouped, we received at the time of compiling this presentation uh, 138 entries in terms of different tools and their versions and we split them into 31 categories um, just to get our heads around them and hopefully these categories make sense to you as well. So we started with uh, time tracking tools uh, used in some uh, programs and uh, you have some examples. So throughout uh, the next few slides you will see the header of the uh, particular category that we thought those tools belong to. We might have got it wrong as well so please um, be feel free to, uh, to update us or to disagree with some of our classification and introduce your own. And Underneath you will see in green from time to time uh, some names of uh, software which were relate uh, we, which were reported at the time of the survey as being uh, free and open source by the uh, network members. So let's go back to this. Um, so time tracking tools, uh, they're extremely useful as uh, we mentioned already in giving the students a very realistic picture of how much time they're spending on which tasks. And they can, like this, uh, they can start seeing how much time they spend researching versus actually translating, versus revising, versus maybe communicating with the client in a team project or troubleshooting. And also this would enable your students to develop time management skills because this is one of the most acutely missed yeah. if you want <laughs> skill that our that our students have um so just and and this is really just a you know you use it and then you visualize what you spent your time on mm. uh, can make them reassess their entire uh, way of working yeah so by using uh, these tools you get uh, uh, depending on the tool of course um, you get a visual representation of where your time went um, at that at one particular time. Um, most of the programs would have a learning management system or virtual learning environment um, such as Blackboard or Moodle to organize their blended learning or online learning resources. Um, some um, programs would also be teaching, like Alina was saying, we're teaching computer clusters and uh, we find it very useful to have tools such as AB Tutor uh, but of course there are others, in order to take over all the computers in the cluster, project our demonstrations onto everyone else's computer, but also uh, see what the students are demonstrating and project their own, just for some more interactive teaching, uh, project their demonstrations onto everyone else's. Um, that's one um, example. File management tools, um, as well useful, you might underestimate, you might think, well, there's Windows Explorer, and what else do people need? But actually, in a company, when you have to deal with a lot of uh, files, and especially if you are um, working on HTML localization projects, you will find that overwriting files is extremely easy, uh, so you might need something a bit better, um, so our students uh, need. And also, it's uh, something that we expect our students uh, to be the digital natives that everyone tells us that they are. Um, and of course they know how to use some technology, but we find that um, they are enthusiastic, but they still have a lot to learn about using technology for professional purposes. 
language learning tools would be useful um, for the uh, for such a computer lab to keep improving our students language skills um, and project management tools as well you have some examples to get them used to planning even things like planning their essays or other projects um, is going to be useful um, sound editing tools, um, depending on the work that you're doing, uh, you might want to, um, if you're doing dubbing, um, this will appear also for dubbing, uh, or if you're doing maybe in subtitling, audiovisual, if you're localizing multimedia, if you're doing games localization with um, sound assets, uh, such a tool will be very handy. Mm -hmm. And then you have, you know, video editing tool. Again, if you're working with uh, multi multimedia materials, um, you may need to um, edit your videos, to cut them, to put them in, in a different sequence. Uh, some tools will allow you to burn your subtitles into onto your video, like the Adobe Premiere Pro. Mm -hmm. um, so these may come in very handy, depending on the kind of training you do. Then uh, the same with, uh, with file conversion tools, if you want very quickly to um, convert the file from, I don't know, from an AVI into a WMV because your subtitling tool only accepts that particular um, extension, then you need something to enable you to do that very quickly and also you need your students to, to be able to do that uh, efficiently as well. Um, and then if you, again, if you want to localize or to expose your students to e-learning localization because there is a huge market mm -hmm. out there for, for this kind of work. Um, or if you want to create further resources to support your students, or if you want your students to create uh, maybe an alternative type of assessment where they are creating uh, an online, a very small online resource showing you how they applied quality assurance to a translation project, then access to an e-learning authoring tool would enable them to, to do that. And there are a variety uh, out there. These are just the examples that we got from, from the survey. Mm -hmm. um, content authoring is extremely important and technical writing also. Um, if you're doing machine translation, if you're doing, well, if you're just creating any kind of content um, is very important to be able to use a variety of tools and also if you're doing technical writing especially um, to have things um, or structures um, that are used in the, in the professional world um, and it's a good idea to get your students uh, used to some of these um, tools already. Um, and then there are um, tools that look at your the content that you've created and they're able to tell you uh, whether it's uh, at the reading level appropriate for your target audience or whether you need to rephrase, um, maybe reduce it uh, in some way, uh, improve it. And there are also other tools such as uh, Perfected um, here that we mentioned, um, which work together with um, style guides and they have we've got a screenshot here so they they are such tools uh, can be plugins for word and then from their menus you would select uh, which uh, style guide you want to apply to the particular content um, that you're looking at and then check whether that content is consistent um, and in accordance to that particular style guide. And if you want to add your own company style guide or if you want to get your students uh, used to creating and updating style guides, they can, of course, uh, do their own and then um, apply them to their own content to check for a consistency. Uh, this is another screenshot just to give you uh, a bit of an idea of what kind of checks can be done automatically. So of course not everything, uh, we're not saying that we are going to train our students to completely take humans out of the equation. It's just that we need to make the best 
uh, use of the technology available in order to be able to concentrate on the more interesting tasks in reviewing content and not just hunt missing commas or strangely used um, hyphens, for instance, which a computer is very good at doing on its own. Um, further on that topic, we could have data profiling tools, a similar concept to see what kind of information um, is uh, in your in your own content, what kind of keywords and so on. And when we're talking about keywords, of course, uh, we're talking about corpora and that's been a very fertile um, domain of development. So there are a lot of free and open source tools for gathering large collections of texts from the web or from your own resources, managing them and also searching through them and maybe extracting terminology as well and seeing developments along timelines and so on. Um, and just a note, um, as we were talking about Lynn uh, Bowker and her suggestion of integrating uh, tools um, and into realistic tasks, you can also now with some tools such as, uh, for instance, Memoc or Memoq, depending on how people want to um, use it, um, you can use corpora and access corpora from within CAT tools so that your students have the complete environment and the whole process of translation becomes more seamless. And then you have alignment tools. Um, again, a lot of CAT tools will have this feature mm -hmm. integrated, um, but then you have separate alignment tools uh, which are doing several other things. Um, and again, you've got examples here. Then you have terminology management tools. Again, some which are coming from a from a CAT uh, tool, others which are terminology, just terminology management mm -hmm. tools. Um, and again, you have again here a, a list of those which are used by the the MT institutions uh, mm -hmm. which uh, responded to this uh, to this survey. And just to illustrate that what the point that Alina was saying, uh, some of the CAT tools already have built-in terminology extraction modules, such as, again, uh, this coming from MOQ. Um, and you can get your students uh, used to um, extracting terminology, refining the criteria, looking for multi-word expressions or single words, um, and so on. And then translating and adding the results to a, uh, to a term base and then use them, uh, use that turbase in a, in a project. And then you have other newer tools if you want, um, such as the speech recognition ones. Um, in Leeds, we, uh, we are integrating uh, Dragon Naturally Speaking within mm -hmm. the, the subtitling, captioning and, and translation uh, processes. Mm -hmm. um, and other institutions do this as well. And it's really useful to get your students progressing from t just typing into a CAT tool to picking up a microphone, connecting it to the to their computers, and then actually starting to dictate. Um, and then you can research, and they can uh, because they're tracking themselves, they can see um, how does the ergonomics of the workplace uh, improve, and also. Uh, does the quality of their work improve? Um, are they more productive? Uh, and other other relevant questions. Uh, we've got um, also worth ver uh, mentioning um, localization workflow um, tools and also automation tools uh, used by the network. And in terms of automation, um, it's this is one of uh, the most more recent articles uh, from STP about how a uh, translation a service a language service provider is working towards uh, improving and optimizing their processes and automating as much as can be automated because at the end of the day not many people like to do repetitive things um, and also business certainly does and uh, doesn't gain a great benefit from just uh, project managers doing the same thing over and over again. So please look at that article uh, because it's very interesting. Um, and just to illustrate the point also, um, and this uh, for variety uh, comes from MemSource, 
the fact that uh, some of the uh, CAD tools now come with specific automation modules for even building a complete workflow from clients submitting content, the content being redirected automatically to uh, freelancers and going through various stages and quotes being generated automatically to client receiving the, the end content. So it can be as complex as that or you, you can automate only a few things. But it's definitely automation is definitely coming. And then, as you might expect, the longest list that we got was the, you know, the, what are called, you know, traditionally CAT tools mm. or translation environment tools, is uh, their newest name, um, where you have a huge variety, and again with some uh, some open source ones, yep. uh, to the the commercial ones uh, that uh, that we all know. But I think on this point, it's very important to make a very quick but important um, observation. Although you will see that there are a lot of um, commercial tools, um, some of them are fairly expensive for professionals. A lot of the companies representing on this slide have excellent and long-standing um, academic programs. So. I don't think right now in 2019 it's no longer a sufficient excuse uh, to say we're not teaching technology because the licenses are too expensive. Um, you will find a variety, so it's definitely more than one. Um, companies on this slide who will be very happy to let you have licenses and let your student have licenses. So combining these with the open source ones will allow you to deliver excellent uh, courses to your students so do try um, something that is coming up or has been coming up for a while but it's sometimes a bit ignored by the ind by by the academics rather is this whole topic of crowdsourcing uh, sometimes we see professionals um, just separating themselves from this community and calling it all kinds of things but Crowdsourcing is part of the um, part of the general picture of what is happening in the industry. It has its uses and it's also integrated in some tools. So, for instance, in Memsource, you can already uh, choose to inc include, if it's appropriate for the project, two crowdsourcing platforms into the into the project. And it's also crowdsourcing, if you read the, the ELIA survey again, um, it's coming up. It's not as big as machine translation post-editing, for instance, of course, um, in its adoption by uh, companies, but it's something that is there, people are not very sure about, and it might be something that's going to grow. So just to take a bit of a breather from, from just having tools thrown at you. Uh, just to mention quickly that in terms of crowdsourcing, uh, one of our PhD students uh, in Leeds, June Young, uh, who graduated last year uh, with an excellent uh, thesis, she looked at the importance of revision and how to organize crowdsourcing. And it was very interesting that she found that, sure, in the first instance, the uh, crowdsourcing community couldn't actually revise its own um, translations. So there were a lot of content and language and style and, well, fewer style and hygiene, but still errors after the first round of translation. But actually, after a further round of peer revision, she found that um, th all of these categories um, the number of errors in all these categories was reduced. So therefore, depending again on the type of content, type of translation quality you're looking for, crowdsourcing might be a viable alternative for you. And if managed appropriately, it can be a solution for a particular project. So we shouldn't just discard it and we should teach our students to work with it. Okay, back to tools. Back to more tools. tools. So more tools. We have localization. So if you want to expose your students to software localization, um, then you will probably need uh, one of these tools. Um, and again, you have uh, you have here um, a few a few listed. Mm -hmm. 
and then the more and more relevant uh, topic of machine translation and machine translation evaluation. So here you've got a, a bit of a mix uh, between evaluation tools and actual machine translation uh, engines, which you can you can use. Uh, some of them you can ad uh, adapt as well. Um, and as again, as you probably know, a lot of CAD tools will have um, such engines already integrated or ready for you to to integrate them um, as part of the as part of the translation project. Uh, so here we have another screenshot from MemoQ, um, where you have really um, a varieties of of tools that you can enable. Yeah. And, yeah, and then you have we're finding probably you know every day you know you can probably every day it's an exaggeration but very frequently you find new platforms that are offering new machine translation solutions you know, this is one of them this was uh, specifically created uh, to deal with online resource resources uh, created as part of online education uh, so MOOCs for example um, and uh, uh, this claims to be a, a, a suitable solution for that type of content, for the translation of that type of content. So you can you can have a look. Uh, then the um, universities part of the European Masters in Translation have been fortunate enough to have access to the um, EU's um, own uh, machine translation, MTATC, mm -hmm. uh, where... Which is now called e-translation. Uh, all the translation. New, well, it's a new technology, so they've got neural, new name as well, um, new capacity. So very exciting. Mm, so again, depending on the type of documents that mm. you are translating, or you want your your students to to be exposed to, and the languages, of course, that you have, this may be a, a useful resource that you may be able to to access. Yeah. Um, so in addition to the um, everything, well, the translation that can be done and post-editing that can be done in CAD tools, it's also very important to teach our students to revise and also assess the, the, the translations of other, um, other students, other translators, and in future other professionals, and to learn how to give objective and meaningful feedback to each other. So for that um, particular functionality, you have uh, language quality assurance, LQA, or translation quality assurance tools integrated into most of the, or some of the CAT tools uh, there, which um, have the, well, all the CAT tools on the slide, but some of the CAT tools available, um, which make the whole revision process a lot more um, effective. And this is just a screenshot on how to configure the TQA in Trados and specify the types of errors that you would want as project manager, your freelancer, your freelance revisers to spot and flag. And um, you might even want to use these kind of automatic scores in order, sorry, the scores are assigned, uh, the errors are assigned manually but then the deductions, the points are deduced, uh, deducted automatically, of course, um, and get an overall uh, score for the, for the tra translation. And this may be also meaningful for uh, teachers as well who are mm. uh, marking a translation which was done by students using a CAT tool mm. and they want to show them specifically what kind of errors they had with the relevant feedback. Um, these pretty graphs are mm. fairly easy now to, to generate in a lot of these tools. This is just an example from Trados, um, where it, it's it's very very easy to uh, to see for for a student uh, what kind of errors were uh, created. Yeah, and what they need to improve on. So what was critical and what was major, and perhaps then they can focus on the mi minor errors. Um, there are also specific uh, quality assurance tools um, in addition to these functionalities that you can find in, in CAT tools and you have a few uh, listed there and this is a screenshot from Xbench um, where you can run uh, your translations and um, also 
uh, reference. Well, you can just check the whole project and you can s make sure, or the tool actually helps you make sure that, for instance, the terminology, the approved terminology for the project was used consistently in the translation, or um, that you don't have um, two, let's say, two source uh, segments who have different uh, translations for no good reason. Um, so again, very, very useful, very popular tool in the industry, uh, which our students should should see and work with. Um, but of course, uh, even within the CAT tools, uh, this is a screenshot from Trados. Um, so even within CAT tools, there are some which have a very well-developed and comprehensive quality assurance uh, section. And again, getting our students to, to learn how to use and modify, not just use the default options, um, is extremely important so that they produce high quality translations. And then you have subtitling tools, of which again there are many, um, and um, you can, of course, it's uh, this. This is a field that's been growing and growing due to the uh, to the popularity of video content over yeah. text content. Uh, so it's probably going to to continue to grow. Um, so again, you've got. Uh, access to a variety of tools um, to in order to enable you to, to train this. Uh, dubbing, not as many tools uh, available or uh, not a subject or topic taught as widely as, as subtitling, but still to a you know to a decent degree. And then the same for uh, for audio description. So this is an access service. Um, and as access services tend to get more and more regu uh, regulated across well across the uh, the EU and and the world, probably this is a service that's going to uh, to require even more attention from from now on. Uh, so having access to training and tools to to do this is uh, is something to look out for. Yeah. So as you can see, we're not suggesting that you should just fill your computers in your clusters with all this technology and ask students to just click on all of them, but actually use them in context and use them to uh, solve a particular problem, such as let's describe this piece of video content. Um, so the last bit is also very relevant for teachers themselves, because now by now some teachers might, or trainers might feel that um, they've been excluded. Uh, because it's all about the students, it's all about the technology that they need to learn in order to uh, to become resilient and uh, future-proof their skills. Um, but actually, while the students are acquiring all these skills, uh, teachers can also use, and students of course can use in their research projects, a variety of tools for uh, usability. So for instance, how are these CAT tools, how ergonomic are they, how are they being used by trainees versus perhaps more proficient um, translators. And the keylogging uh, key uh, studies um, have, been, uh, have been very numerous um, since uh, the research center in Copenhagen introduced uh, the technology and then a lot of research centers uh, use this technology in order to see how translators work or revisers work, um, so as part of process uh, studies. And then what do we do when we have a lot of statistics, uh, maybe from eye tracking, maybe from something else? Um, it seems that some of the EMT networks are using um, R and R Studio to to turn these um, this raw data into something more meaningful. Um, and visual as well. And then when it comes to writing, um, of course, in the academic world, publishing is highly valued. Um, a few tools that were mentioned by the network uh, can be very helpful in organizing your references and uh, spending more time writing, less time looking for, uh, for the details of uh, particular publishers. So this kind of brings to an end this particular section of our presentation about what we found from this survey in terms of the, the technology that is taught uh, across the EMT uh, members who uh, replied to our survey. Mm -hmm. um, 
we hope that this offered a bit of a you know an overall picture of of what they're doing and maybe gave you some ideas of what which things you can pick and uh, and integrate into your own uh, into your own training but at the same time you know coming back to our initial point is to in addition to all of these tools um, we should train the students to be you know, skeptical in this technology to to be able to use it and to to be able to use it well but also to be able to use it creatively and work around it um, when maybe a um, an already packaged solution doesn't exist yeah and um, also just to uh, remind everyone there isn't one uh, or from what we've seen there isn't one program in the EMT network that has absolutely all these technologies but we found the and we thought you would appreciate as well to see that actually when we think about setting up a very useful technological environment having them and acquiring them is not that difficult and also it helps both our students and ourselves as trainers so maybe this could become um, or start the discussion towards uh, the standard technology setup for a translation technologies uh, course okay so now so now we talked about chapter. technology another we're moving on to uh, to another chapter of how we should teach all of this you know how can you integrate a lot of this technology and at the same time make it realistic for the students to be very engaged and to gain meaningful skills from all of this uh, so we are very much believers in project-based activities um, giving student give students real problems uh, but are problems which are coming from authentic contexts and here you know having partnerships with real people um, so we work a lot with with NGOs with institutions uh, where um, who, who are able to to constantly feed us problems contexts resource files uh, which we can use in the way in which we uh, we train our students yeah. so sometimes it's tempting for uh, trainers to try and act as clients but especially if they don't really have the industry experience then they're not going to be able to imagine all the things that can go wrong and therefore it's easier to just be confident enough and comfortable letting go and you lose you might feel you lose a bit of control but actually your students uh, gain a lot from a realistic situation so this is just to again going back to our module our computer assisted translation module and, you know how do we integrate uh, such project activities in in this very big uh, module um, well first of all this is a compulsory and the main part of our MA in applied translation studies program for our students uh, is the equivalent in ECTS of 22.5 so a lot of contact time and a lot of individual and teamwork uh, hours which are expected to be put in um, by the students and we give students a lot of technology um, a lot of different technology as well so you see we've got things which appeared in different categories in the uh, in the survey that we uh, which we've we've just shown you it doesn't mean that we teach all of these tools to the same extent um, they will appear at different times within the timeline so of course you don't teach a tool in the same way in halfway semester two um, as a tool that you used in the first few weeks in semester one um, so you know you, you have to adapt how you do this maybe some tools and in addition to this we have other tools as well and our students know that those are available in the labs and they can always access them even if they don't appear as such on the module outline and I think this is important uh, for students to know and also it's important for us to push the students to be inquisitive and to to be a bit more proactive when it comes to their own development and their own ex exposure to, to to technology because we will never have time to to teach them all and why should we um, 
And as we said before, we also talk quite a lot about industry standards and what they mean. We talk about uh, what it means to be a professional, the ethics behind it, uh, because having a profession and having a job are two different things. Um, and what does it mean to to act as a as a professional in this in this market? Um, and as we said before, one way of achieving, of putting all of these things together is in collaborative team projects. And we have three of these uh, in one year, which means that it's, it's quite intense. Um, and we assign different roles to, to different students um, and we give them very, very mixed scenarios and very mixed types of problems and files to deal with. Yeah, so we, we want our students to experience uh, the project both from the project manager side but also from the freelancer, translator and the revisors uh, side and then they might um, work as terminologists uh, but these three roles are the ones that they everyone or most students uh, will, will experience. Um, so just to give you uh, an idea about these projects, um, they are multilingual because we teach a cohort of uh, students with a diverse uh, language pair, uh, with diverse language pairs. Um, and so far every year we've had um, usually more than six teams because of the large numbers of students in our cohorts and more than 10 language combinations. Uh, we ask our students to do translation, uh, post-editing machine translation, revision, and then sometimes added services could be subtitling. Uh, quite often they do web page and image localization. And then again, uh, sometimes depending on the time, the type of materials received from the NGOs that we work with as clients, they might also need to do some desktop publishing. Um, we, through these exercises, uh, we managed to um, teach them a few useful things about project management, about finance, everyone has to do uh, finance, uh, problem solving and teamwork and resilience as well because as you know things don't actually go as planned um, and they work with the CAD tools uh, they studied and they use them sometimes in projects with students across the world um, so there might be sometimes a situation where they use different tools uh, as well. Um, in terms of cli end clients, we've uh, worked with the World Fair, uh, Fair Trade Organization um, in the past with um, uh, German online publication, with charities such as Roundabout and Techo, and many, 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 many other um, NGOs who are very kind to send realistic texts that normally wouldn't be translated uh, that our students can work on and then um, some of the end clients also send feedback to the students uh, afterwards which is very motivating and very useful. But also it means that these clients can actually set very realistic tasks for mm -hmm. example um, sometimes they will have too much content for our students to actually yeah. deal in, in one project, which means that they need to do some content profiling together. They need to talk about the type of quality which is needed. Um, is this con which content is the most prominent one and which content can maybe have, you know, needs to have a different workflow because it's for a completely different purpose. So all of these I ideas which maybe wouldn't come naturally to you know a traditional trainer if you want um, were it not for these uh, for these NGOs so we are very grateful for to them for for bringing in all of this relevant uh, tasks into into our program yeah. so since 2012 um, we've had if my math is correct uh, 23 projects um, in in our center and as you can see from the from the map we've been collaborating with partner universities uh, in three continents and uh, we've been able through these collaborations to give our students the realistic uh, experience of having to work with freelancers and linguists uh, in different time zones using different currencies using different technology and having different availability and so on and communication manners and 
everything that comes uh, comes with that. Um, if you want to read more about this, uh, one of our former students, uh, Adam Dewhurst, um, he's been uh, he wrote for the CIOL um, for the linguist the publication uh, about one of the projects that he was a project manager for. Um, our students worked with uh, our uh, collaborator in, in France, in Metz, and you can see what uh, the experience was and what kind of, how the project was organized um, and maybe get some ideas from there as well. So going back to how should we teach, mm -hmm. as we said, these projects help us enormously, give students um, a lot of interaction with other people, which sometimes is, is it's uh, something that's overlooked in, mm -hmm. in some programs and it's something that it's highly uh, required. Mm -hmm. um, they give them access to problems. Mm -hmm. um, they give them access to a scenario where they can also be wrong and mm -hmm. receive feedback on what they were wrong about. They give them access to a context where they can reflect on what was good, what was bad, what they can what they can improve, and access to uh, to a place where they can apply as much technology as they want or as much technology as they, they feel is relevant to in order to deliver on time within budget and uh, within the with the the, the quality uh, expected. Yeah, and we found that. Um, one project is useful, but it's not really enough throughout the year to bring this home, the, all of these ideas and concepts that Alina mentioned um, and make the students really identify with them and get used to them. So this is why we run uh, three of these projects. We would run more if we could, but uh, the time is short. Um, so think about this in your module design plan for several rounds of trial, error, feedback, let's do it again in a slightly different context, trial, error, feedback, and so on. Um, so something that um, is uh, one of the lessons that comes out quite quickly uh, from our project is that there is a very important role for the project manager because sometimes, the, especially freelancers, they don't really have a very positive view of project managers, but through these projects, our students uh, get a broader perspective and they actually see the amount of work that project managers put in. Um, everyone is timing themselves uh, doing the tasks of the project and they can also from project to project they are looking to become more efficient and also see what kind of roles they prefer, what kind of tasks uh, they prefer. So we also uh, ask them to do different things. So here you've got a chart showing uh, the time that uh, they spend on translation versus revision. And again, this is a tool which enables students to see what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, um, and maybe design a strategy for them in terms of development. You know, am I a too slow a reviser or am I a very fast translator, which means that I can um, provide translations into with a very quick turnaround time, which mm -hmm. makes me particularly uh, productive. productive yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, at the same time, we ask them to, as Dragos was saying, uh, to actually provide quotes and to do research into realistic uh, pricing methods that they should be uh, using for, for the task that they have to deliver. Um, and at the end, we see, okay, how much money did you make for the tasks that you are completing? Again, this is for translation and revision, but we said this might be post-editing or it might be subtitling or it might be uh, DTPing, uh, depending on, on the project. And then they can see, oh, you know, I'm under the minimum wage for my, uh, for my translation. Maybe I need to reconsider my, my strategy. And then, of course, they can put together this information and the information about the, the time that they spent doing this uh, to see where they can go, what they can improve. You know, where does where is the market? Can the market support uh, them charging whatever it is that they're charging? Yeah, and sometimes, our as you can see, sometimes they're a bit optimistic about what they can charge, so they 
first of all they gain negotiation skills um, but if they manage to get past their project manager they will still have to deal with clients in the end this is fake money by the way mm -hmm. but it's still useful to help them gain a more realistic view of uh, what they could uh, charge out there so um, one of the final points we're going to make about uh, how we're teaching it's important to do the projects it's important to do the uh, technology and uh, reinforce the skills the technological skills but it's even more important to uh, make our students into um, reflective um, professionals really so from everything they need to learn uh, something even when things are going wrong as Alina was saying so we are always in our projects we're asking them to give uh, both uh, peer feedback and also reflect on their own uh, experience and they learn they have uh, several perspective this way um, in addition to the tutors pers perspective and uh, general feedback that they get and you might you actually might be surprised how useful and helpful uh, these peer corrections peer feedback actually is uh, sometimes you might think that well our students aren't professional enough they can't really say anything meaningful to each other but you will be surprised uh, because they learn a lot from each other so we should encourage them to do more so um, Again, because you're watching a video, I think you can pause this and read the whole um, the whole quote. Uh, but it's one of the statements from our uh, students who was reflecting on her performance and how from the translation stage to the revision stage, she actually uh, started to appreciate a lot more the collaborative aspect of the project, her particular role within the larger project and the, the added uh, value that the, her colleague and the revisers uh, and the technology as well uh, were, were uh, adding to, to the project. So, okay. yeah. given that uh, you know, we, we, have, we can have access to a lot of technology, a lot of resources, maybe some of us also are doing these, uh, these projects, how can we assess this? Um, because it's it's quite hard and when we are in a training institution we need to assess this mm -hmm. and you will probably agree that a lot of courses will have very traditional methods of assessment which are essays or a translation task or exam to be done in a in a capital mm -hmm. we believe and in our experience um, having a portfolio is a lot more meaningful and useful exercise for both the students and the and the trainers in that it makes you reflect on 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 the type of of teaching that that you do so for our for this particular module we ask a portfolio which has a variety of files so mm. there are cat specific deliverables from several tools to enable to demonstrate that the student has accessed and knows how to um, how to create those files mm. to linguistic resources in several exchange formats because we know uh, being able to convert from one tool to the other is, is, is quite useful. And then additional files such as offer of services, quotes, uh, students who create terms of, and conditions or who adapt available terms and conditions. Uh, we want students to be able to also to invoice or to know what an invoice is. Um, mm -hmm. So these are all the things that we include um, in our assessed portfolio. Yeah, so you can pause this video and study this in more detail. Um, this is a screenshot from the top of our uh, portfolio submission guidelines um, telling you exactly what we are asking for, uh, which Alina has just presented. So um, after all this deluge of information, um, I hope you're still with us. <laughs> um, so what technology can we integrate and how can we teach it um, it might you might feel a bit overwhelmed you might think um, I can't possibly do this all on my own um, but actually we have found in our experience that uh, you're never alone uh, you always have a very strong support network and also a lot of resources are already out there 
So in terms of support network, uh, you have a variety of uh, networks of uh, translation teachers and translation trainers and programs and companies as well, um, such as the European Masters in Translation Network, which is a, is a, a network across Europe, or for instance, um, French, um, the French Association was actually the first one I think created before EMT. Um, now there is one in the UK as well. Uh, there's the International Network of Simulated Translation Bureaus, which is uh, promoting project-based uh, learning. And I'm sure there are many other um, organizations, um, especially LEI Exchange and other organizations uh, out there to, to learn from. And then there are EU funded projects and these are examples of projects that we uh, that we uh, have or had in, in Leeds. Uh, I'm sure then in, in all the institutions there will be at least one such project developing resources for translators or for the trainers. Mm. Um, so in DigiLink this is our latest uh, project um, where we are creating online courses for the digital linguists so these are all going to be available for free using Moodle platform um, starting in spring 2019 um, and we are preparing courses from corpus linguistics to um, translation localization uh, to um, machine translation. So have a look on on our on our page, and hopefully this will be uh, this will be useful for us. We are using this in a in a blended learning scenario where students where we give um, uh, parts of these modules or an entire module for the students to watch at home, and then maybe we have some activities in in the um, in the class. Um, based on on that information so the digiling project is uh, was initiated by the university of ljubljana one of our uh, long-term collaborators um, and so the university of ljubljana took the initiative uh, to gather uh, several universities as well as one technology partner in order to um, put together these online interactive uh, resources uh, which respond to real uh, industry needs, so employer uh, needs. Um, Ecolore is also a project that uh, is now in the process of being moved uh, to the Translation Commons website, um, but you can still, if you really want to, uh, you can still access its resources. Um, and it's the very interesting, it's still relevant, and uh, also the added uh, interesting value of Ecolore is that mm -hmm. it was localized at the time um, uh, this was a project started uh, at the University of Leeds uh, by Tony Hartley and partners and um, the resources were localized in a, quite a, an impressive range of languages. So you might find that there you, already there are teaching resources in your own language uh, available to use. Um, professional associations and individuals we have mentioned, you have the support of all of these professional organizations that survey their members uh, regularly so you can keep up with what is needed uh, by the industry and also um, associations such as LEA Exchange uh, have started putting together a very useful series of webinars and this is a screenshot of this particular initiative. And then you have a lot of volunteer communities um, such as Translators Without Borders um, and the Translation Commons. Um, of course, these are very different organizations, the Translators Without Borders uh, offering um, inspiration in terms of resources and types of workflows and projects which are very different from traditional commercial projects um, but also offering students opportunities to to volunteer um, in a very exciting field and then you have translation commons which is more which is an online platform um, aiming to create resources and to support trainers and trainees um, in the um, in the development of their skills for the for the language industry and also yeah well, to build a community of practitioners and trainees and smoothing the way of our students joining the the industry 
Um, further, you have training resources that are created by the industry, and I hope, well, I, yes, I hope, uh, actually, um, that everyone is uh, listening to the Globally Speaking podcast because um, very regularly, uh, this is already outdated by, I think, three, three episodes, um, uh, Renato and Michael, they, they post very interesting interviews with uh, professionals from a variety of companies talking about what localization means to them. Uh, you have a mix of technology, literary translation, uh, you have translation buyers, you have users. It's a really interesting, very to the point uh, resource to follow. And we have also seen companies such as Google um, producing high quality um, resources, uh, MOOCs, uh, massive online open courses such as these localization essentials. Uh, which you can ask your students to have a look at in order to gain a better view about the, the big picture of how localization happens and how content is produced and uh, how they actually can have a meaningful impact in their careers. And then, of course, we have academic in industry publications, which are you know not to be uh, overlooked. Um, and we already um, have, as we mentioned before, through academic partnerships, um, for example, MemSource in their as part of their academic partnership, uh, they also provide uh, students, uh, but also trainers, access to multilingual um, magazine, which uh, you will probably agree that it's a very respected um monthly magazine uh, bringing you um, a lot of uh, information from the localization world yep. um, where there's a mix of um, industry practitioners and academics um, and uh, and clients talking about the language service industry the 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 services which are needed the skills needed the types of projects which are happening uh, so it's it's a very diverse and well informed publication yeah um if you're still on the as they say in English, on the fence, so you're not really decided should you actually make the effort to pick up uh, or study this uh, whole technological aspect to translation. Um, what are some incentives? In terms of career progression, at the moment, it seems that uh, we're just doing a very non-scientific, um, just a bit of uh, a fun search. Um, if you're looking for a professor of translation technologies uh, roles, you could actually see that there was only one person in the world, um, Tony Harley, who had this role officially. And if you're looking for a professor of translation technology, um, I think there were, again, uh, there's an upcoming role and um, Susan Armstrong, lays to Susan Armstrong, um, had this role. So it seems that at the moment we're not in a position where translation technology is recognized in its own right. Uh, you will have throughout the world um, academics working in translation studies and being uh, translation studies and technology or um, their role just not yet uh, focusing on translation technology. So you might wonder is this a serious enough field and we see that in recent years we've uh, started having in addition to the very relevant uh, journals and special issues and articles uh, we've also started to um, see a few published books uh, specific on translation technology so that is uh, a very very good uh, well it's very good news um, and so in terms of career progression, there is hope that this will become a bit more of a recognized field um, and some evidence that it is becoming that. And But also, first of all, it's I think it will be useful uh, to start thinking about the really interesting topics that we as academics could uh, look into if we make the transition from, uh, well, to translation technology to integrating it into our practices. So we can look into how technology is used by a variety of target groups. We could research how post-editing machine translation um, 
uh, impacts the quality and the productivity and this is one topic which is actually quite well researched uh, but as always as new um, engines are developed and approaches um, there's always more work to be done and but there's also something that uh, we've been looking at um, in Leeds also study workflows and interactions um, how effective are they how can we prepare our students better for the workplace um, and again to reference uh, one study that June um, did and we, we contributed to uh, we've been working on looking at how uh, the interactions in the student projects can help us build a different picture or a different kind of visualization of what's happening in in the projects again for the purpose of giving students a complete picture of where they are so June uh, looked at one of our projects from uh, uh, from the past years from 2015 and it was a pretty large uh, project uh, it was one conducted with uh, our students uh, students from the University of Ljubljana as well as students from the University of uh, Texas it included a lot of language pairs of course because there were 67 uh, freelancers and also 10 further project managers and they were translating uh, subtitling and also localizing a variety of web pages and images with a variety of tools for a variety of end clients so it was a, a pretty representative um, project for uh, for what we do so when analyzing the interactions in this uh, project uh, june was uh, she, she looked at a lot of email exchanges uh, because by the way we um, we look at these exchanges as part of the feedback that we give our students uh, we want to uh, give them meaningful feedback and useful feedback not only about how they use the technology but also how they communicate with each other and how they solve problems so um, this is a breakdown of uh, roughly um, the number of emails or the proportion uh, proportion rather um, in the setup stage in the localization stage uh, revision and finalization stages and <clears throat> as a result of uh, this research um, you can then build uh, visualizations and you can see for instance um, that in the setup stage the role of the project managers and the client is well cannot be underestimated and then when we move on to the localization stage a uh, few translators are coming through uh, because they are the more active ones they are ones who have uh, perhaps terminology questions as well as terminology solutions and they are getting um, active in the network and helpful and then you can see also that uh, when we're going to the revision stage um, the individual freelancers are no longer as active but the project managers still remain in charge uh, maintaining the workflow and controlling the process and then in the fin finalization stage again it's uh, project managers and clients mainly so through these visualizations with such data uh, of course data coming from a trainee uh, project so we're not saying that this is what happens in the professional world all the time but it's these are interactions um, by MA uh, students in a project that was set up according to industry guidelines and advice so I think it's getting quite close to the to real life so we're looking at the interactions and the students are starting to appreciate the work and the many tasks uh, that the PMs are, are handling and of course you can model this in, in a variety of ways for example if in your research you are interested um, to, to look on the impact that optimization of certain project management uh, steps 
um, may have. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you can implement that, then you can run another project, and then you can see in terms of interactions whether the optimization reduced the number of emails or actually, you know, they exploded. So mm -hmm. there are there are really a lot of th a lot a lot of ways to explore. Um, and to do really meaningful research um, in um, while at the same time you know, running while running these projects. Yeah, yeah. So teaching and research. Uh, it's a nice carrot. So again, uh, we really don't want to, uh, and we don't think any one of us in the community wants to train uh, students just to do repetitive tasks because they will be expandable. They they will lose uh, their roles uh, as the technology becomes uh, better and workflows also change and we just want to thank you all uh, for your time we hope that the information uh, we've shared uh, is useful uh, we also thank everyone who has contributed to to this information from the MT network from the professional associations uh, our colleagues and uh, from companies, LSPs, um, and we hope that you will all have happy and interesting students as we have been fortunate to, to have uh, in Leeds for, for a while. So as the title says, here's to skeptical, ethical, but also well-prepared graduates who go on to have happy and meaningful and rewarding careers in the, in the language services industry. And thank you for your attention. We are aware that this uh, this has been a fairly long uh, presentation, but hopefully, if not all of it, maybe some chunks were, were meaningful to you. Um, and if you are interested or if you'd like to exchange ideas on any of the content that we uh, presented uh, during, uh, during this, please get in touch. You have our details on, on the slide here. We'd be very happy to, to hear from you and to maybe start working together. Thank you again and goodbye. Bye-bye.